starting this off, I think it'd be best if you want to give a little bit about yourself and what you do online with people in Zoom and on your YouTube channel. You know, how would you describe what all that is about? Well, I'm just a, a pawn, really, in a much larger game. I don't think uh, I don't think there's anything particular about me that isn't prevalent universally. Like we're all part of this whole thing that's going on called life. So there's nothing nothing specific I can add to that. If you think of it like a giant machine, and some people are a little cog, and some people are a big cog. I mean, I'm a very little cog, but there's. Mm -hmm. And overall working to the machine and it, like every, we're all the same, you know, we're all just playing our parts perfectly. So as far as uh, what I do, um, it's just a part. I'm just playing a part. Yes. I can't, really, I can't really give any clarity to that because the whole nature of the part I play is generally mirac miraculous, notwithstanding uh, the interpretation of it, you know, which is what we're always seem to be dealing with. You know, we're always looking at what's not appearing as uh, the miracle or seemingly not appearing as the miracle, trying to discern the miracle from within it. You know? mm -hmm. But it's like literally the miracle's here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything yeah. else is just the packaging. It's like, you know, it's just, just the buff. Yeah. I'm part of that buff. It's the experience and it's <laughs> happening that's... Uh, you know, and that has nothing to do with me. That's by the grace of God. Mm. So. so your role is to be the buff to show the miracle, to illuminate basically, the miracle. Basically. Yeah. I'm just I'm 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 superficial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the mo in the moment you witness to the miracle, it's like I'll disappear. Like mm. literally I'll disappear. Yeah. So it's like what what role then did I actually ever play? What do I actually ever do? Like tr in in truth, there's nothing happening here, and and nothing going on at all. There is no Dave, and there is no Gary, and there is no interview. There's just this superficial framework being set up for the witness to something that's beyond what it represents in its entirety, yeah. and that yeah. leaves you always in the in that moment of stillness. It's like, well, what the hell do you mean by that? And you can't work it out with what's going on in here in the grey matter. Like you actually have to enter into it. You actually have to join to go beyond conscious comprehension. Yeah. All right. Now we're getting somewhere. All right. Now we're getting. <laughs> How do we go about that? What does this entering process look like into? You are the entering process. You're it. Right. Literally. You are the lock and you are the key. Or if I if I were to look at me, let's say, as uh, an idea of a person who, uh, and from the perspective of being a person, I, uh, I come with all the attributes of a typical person. I don't know where I am, why I'm here, what the meaning of life is or anything. And the process of being consciously aware of myself sort of seems to suggest that that consciousness can be used to work out my situation and to help me navigate it. But in actual fact, it's like a fish in a fishbowl. You can only navigate within the parameters of your fishbowl, right? The evolutionary process deems it necessary that you've got to get out of that fishbowl. Right? Mm -hmm. To do that, you cannot use the mechanisms and facilities that are available to you within the fishbowl because they're only relative to what, you know, to your, to your immediate situation. You're looking for something that's beyond your situation, which is why any time you ever have a, a true moment, it's always going to be predicated by faith, ah, which yeah. is a step into the unknown. I don't know, but I'm willing to take that step. I don't know how to take that step, but I'm willing to just, you know, and you kind of fall. There's this there's this sort of falling into it. This It's very clumsy. <laughs> mm. Because knowledge, knowledge is only of self. You can't have knowledge of how it is that you're going to enter into the experience of self. Yeah, you know, like one thing is true and one thing is false, and it's like you have to decide. And the miracle really is a way of sorting out what's true from what's false. Mm -hmm. mm. You yeah. can't do you can't do that by asking questions. 
It's an action. <laughs> it's yeah. an action, and you have to you have to actually enter it. You have to actually go into it. You know, because we'll be asking questions here for a million years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. End of interview. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's some irony in there. I know, right? Off but, the interview at that, be like, okay, that's it, folks. Exactly, but <laughs> but you're always up against that point, right? Seen rightly, you're always at that place. I'm always there in that moment where the next moment or, or this moment, the here and the now, which is impossible to put your finger on specifically, but the here and the now of uh, my decision-making process is always going to be um, founded on what is my purpose, Mm. If my purpose is um, to maintain the illusion or the integrity that I seem to have, pardon me, with the avatar, with the vessel, with this body, then uh, my purpose is going to be entirely ambiguous and one day to the next is going to tell me how to maintain the health and longevity of that, you know, to whatever to whatever degree I can discern it. But if my purpose is the healing of the mind, okay, from the ignorance that this thing seems to represent, then at a certain point I have to go beyond what this seems to represent because it can only ever represent ignorance. Mm. It can't. There's no true answers in the conscious mind. There's nothing. There's only a realisation that there's nothing in there. Mm. Right? Once you have that realisation that there's no hope, you know, like I think it's Old Testament, give up all hope all ye who enter here. But there's no hope in the mind of finding your way out of the conundrum of human the human experience. Yeah. And yeah. yet within you, all hope exists. Just not where you're looking for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I like the metaphor of the fishbowl. Right. Exactly. You can't exactly. swim out of the fishbowl. Exactly. Right? You just keep going around and around in the fishbowl. If you want to know what it's like on the moon, you've got to go to the moon. You can you can theorize and scientize and everything, you know, like you've got to do it. Yeah. So, mm. so like this moment, literally, this moment, you and I in this thing is presenting a platform for saying yes to something that's beyond our conscious awareness and beyond our ability to grasp with conscious awareness. And yet it's something that we know well. It's something that in your mind, in my, in my mind, it's already a given. It's a thing. And perhaps in your mind, because we seem to exist in this framework of time where we're all really headed in the right direction. We're living resurrection. We're living 2,000 years post Jesus doing his thing, you know. <laughs> but within each of us is our own time, our own sliding scale of where we associate with that. You know, Alpha, Omega, and then somewhere in the middle there's an observer looking at what's going on, well, the miracle collapses Alpha and Omega together to limit, 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 limit what's going on and to bring the awareness of the limitation of the human experience to, to greater predominance so the, the facility or the, or the urgency for awakening actually collapses in on you. And if you're a student of A Course in Miracles, you'll be aware of uh, the nature of the teachings about the collapse of time where Alpha and Omega are brought together in relationships and you collapse, you snip out the uh, the sections that have been going over, like cyclically going over and over, and you've been wandering around saying, why does this keep happening to me? What is this relation? It's showing me something, but it just keeps shut. And you snip all of that out. Finally, in the learning of the lesson, and the next time that situation comes around again, there's no question, right? The trigger has been removed. The block's been removed. There's no question. And you carry on in the sequence that, that you know, all of a sudden you're out of that loop. And, you know, like people say, you know, if you, if you work in a city, I feel like I'm in a rut, you know, and it's like all of a sudden you're out of that rut and there's a moment of freedom. You're like, wow, finally, I'm not doing that same crazy behaviour anymore. I'm not doing that anymore. I've had this healing moment. And then on to the next one, and there's another loop, another loop, another loop. And that's essential because the universe is one of relationships. It's not about form or time and space or anything like that. It's about a relationship, a universal relationship. And you're either entering into the nature of your relationship with the universe as it is, or you're trying to make it up for yourself on your own terms 
and probably struggling badly at that and wondering what the hell you're doing wrong. You know? So literally, literally, you're learning to go with the flow. <laughs> That's it. That's basically it. We're learning to go with the flow. But the process of that learning is something that you have to master. You have to have it so integral, like Jesus says in the Course in Miracles, it says you have you have to overlearn this course to learn it. Yeah. It's not something you can just pick it up, read in a weekend, and then go, oh, yeah, I get that. And then because then you'll just go on to the next book. You'll pick up Eckhart Tolle or something and, oh, the power and out. This is like Course in Miracles, you know, and you'll – so. There's a, there's a point of entry where you realise that it's collapsing in on you. The sense of urgency builds in you and it's like a student at a college approaching a, a, a moment where their exam is happening tomorrow and they haven't done any study. All of a sudden that urgency to study and that urgency to be about it comes crashing down on you and you're, you've got like this final moment, right? That's the same in this, Exactly. But whilst time and space seems to be part of your linear equation, um, that urgency seems to be way off. I'm probably going to live to be 85 years old. I've got plenty of time to think about things like this, you know, later and whatever. It's like, no, you don't. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, what is the relevance of Jesus? Do all roads lead to Jesus in A Course in Miracles? In the Western world, yes. For the West, yeah. In 1975, or it was 1965, if you want to look at it technically, in 1975, A Course in Miracles was first published, entered the domain of consciousness, and became the predominant Western technology for spiritual participation. You can argue with that. You can you can do whatever you like with it. It doesn't. It's not up to me to tell you that that's how it is or not how it is. You'll believe it or not believe it. Once you start reading it, you'll believe it. Mm -hmm. Once you start reading it. And if you look at it as the idea, if you go right back to to Moses, right, or right back to Adam, and like you can you can imagine, you know, like the analogies and the stories that go on through the Old Testament, all the way, there's always these shifts. There's another prophet with greater clarity. There's another teacher with a bit more clarity. Add to whatever the last prophet came in and is out and helps us to raise up and understand concepts from the point of view where perhaps, let's say, if you look at it from Darwinism, Darwinism, uh, we were probably cavemen at one stage clubbing each other, other over the heads. And if you had have given them a, a theory on quantum physics, for example, they'd <laughs> look at you like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And nowadays, hopefully, consciousness is raised up enough that we can begin to integrate the more complex concepts and the principles that those concepts embody from A Course in Miracles, which are fundamentally the same as from like the Gitas and and the Vedas and things like that and and Buddhist doctrines and things that go way back. The only difference is that as with the advent of more prophets and more teachers and more people that enhance the message, a Course in Miracles is now a more enhanced message together. It's a complete message. Mm-hmm. So where at one time you might have gone from several teachers, several sources for your information and uh, taken, I think, Buddhism, what, 14 lifetimes before you can reach enlightenment or something in, in um, Tibetan doctrine. But um, now it's we're here. We're here. You know, do you want it or not? Uh, you know, there's I nothing see. there's nothing preventing the mind from awakening now we can grasp the notion that um all time is happening all the time right and that and that there's nothing outside of my mind right there is no such thing as time and space there's only here and now mm. right i'm the dreamer of my dream the world's an illusion when I integrate that into my psychology, into my psyche, and allow it to sort of mess with the defences and the mechanisms of what I believe to hold my human construct together, stuff starts to happen. It's like why I love the workbook of A Course in Miracles. You've got 365 lessons. 
You know, you show me any other text, any other discipline in the world that has literally such an orchestrated uh, process of um, evolution as far as retraining the mind goes, and I'll be like gobsmacked because there isn't one. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. If you look at the Course in Miracles, let's say specifically as an, a new insertion of light, right? And it's like all of a sudden we've been struggling with these old Vedantic sort of techniques and other things and going on and trying to fathom our way through all this stuff and coming to sort of broad acre conclusions. Now it's sort of like ooh, right down, you know, even even beyond the point of um let's say biblical uh, study you know if you if you're if you're a scholar of the new testament say you read the book of matthew or something like that sermon on the mount and then you read course in miracles it makes perfect sense of the sermon on the mount everything all of a sudden it's like holy crap i never heard it that way like it's just oh yeah mind blowing and you realize that you've been propelled you realise that you've been rocketed forward in, in your own association to this sort of celestial speed up that's going on and you're sort of connecting with the frontier of what's actually occurring as far as um, lower to higher communication is, you know. I talk to people almost every... I spoke to a woman this morning from, from uh, Ukraine. She's living elsewhere at the moment because of the thing. But she's been having these incredible moments of light in her mind, which I, I get those all the time, but she's to her, it's like a brand new occurrence, right? And the, these dreams and things that's going on for her, which she can't explain. She's work, trying to work it out. All of a sudden she's found my videos specifically and the course in miracles and things are starting to drop in. And she's realizing now how far actually consciously from the rising up from the dross of consciousness that she's being propelled. Her relationships with her family, friends, everything like that is just falling far behind and uh, she's entering into a whole new understanding in a matter of months, not years, not lifetimes, not, you know, with virtually very little study required. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like that's that's like when you can really appreciate from a perspective of your own personal transformation, you'll be like gobsmacked. And I've I've introduced the course to people who've been doing, have been studying Buddhism for for decades, and all of a sudden they 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 say things to me, you know, like how how in a period of so many few years did you get to the stage you're at? And I'm like, here, just read this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not yeah. it's no secret. I'm no incredible scholar. This is what's being offered by Jesus. Like when you ask me, um, where is Jesus relative to all this? Well, Jesus is literally the head of the atonement. Right? In consciousness, if you imagine consciousness as a thin band in mind that vibrates within a cause and effect relationship of uh, being born and here and dying over here and all the possible things within it, right? all those possible things within the framework of time and space are all underlined by death. There's nothing here that doesn't die from little tiny flowers in the field to whales to planets, star systems, everything existing, not existing, coming into appearance, disappearing from appearance. Right? Within that, in consciousness, there's this collective association that somewhere within all that framework was this guy called Jesus. I mean, you could look at Enoch as well, but there's not much written about Enoch, you know. Just I think it says he didn't die, you know. So it's not much of a a resume, you know. But this collective thing with Jesus, oh yeah, Jesus is the guy that you know. And if you're a Catholic, he didn't resurrect. But if you're if you're just a general Christian, he went through that whole crucifixion, resurrection, three days in the tomb, resurrection. Put your fingers in my ho holes here, uh, Thomas, you know, and like this whole witnessing thing which has now been taken on in consciousness, and it's a chink in the armour, right? And from an outsider's point of view, let's say, well, was there really a Jesus? I didn't see him, you know, like I, I don't really know. I'd have to take that on faith. Yes, exactly. Right? You have to take it on faith. Then you can be shown. 
if you're still in here, like we started this interview, if you're still in here trying to work it out in your in your questioning mind with your pointy little brain that doesn't have any answers, you're not going to learn anything. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> faith, true faith. Mm -hmm. Faith, yeah, faith. You have to live in faith. That's all you've got. There's n literally nothing else in this world you got. Everything else will fail you. Yeah. Everything. Doesn't matter how many spiritual texts you master. Doesn't matter how many yogic practices you can, you can, you know, nothing. Yeah. Faith, faith and devotion. Faith is its own reward. You know, one, one little leap into faith builds your faith. <laughs> That's good. Eventually, yeah. eventually you have all these leaps of faith. You have all these little moments within the framework of all the relationships you find yourself in where instead of solving your own problems, you're asking for the miracle, which is a leap into faith. And they, they're associative. They, 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 they um, what do you call it? They're accumulative. Mm. All of a sudden, you find Alpha and Omega closing in. You've got all these references for faith working. You begin to realize, I actually am supported by some kind of higher power. I can't explain it. I don't know what the hell. And then it gets to the point, I want to know what that is. Yeah. I'm tired of seeing it at work in my life. I want actual connection. Mm. You know, I want direct union with God. Yeah. So ultimately, that's what the faith is in. It's a higher power than our feeble monkey minds and the exactly. human body altogether. Yeah. It's there's something way, way, way greater than way beyond. You can't. You can't even begin. You know. Mm. I mean, what do you put your faith in the government? <laughs> <laughs> that's not a good idea. Yeah. 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 And it's faith in something that is. Would you say? Um, benevolent something that's on your side per se absolutely you mm -hmm. may not see that initially it's going to require a lot of humbling of pride and and you know like people refer to it as the death of the ego yeah but uh, until that death you know you'll have you can have a <laughs> you can have a very slow gradual painful death at which point your ego will continually try to recover or you can just be about it continually live in faith step into those moments and have that ongoing witnessing to the nature of the miracle in your life, which builds up this kind of other waypoint or this other reference in your mind for something other than your own struggles and your own ability to deal with things. You know, and I always tell people, it's like, man, as quickly as you can be about this, the better. Like, let it become really apparent really quickly. I've met quite a lot of people who will tell me things like, oh, I had a shift in consciousness 10 years ago. It's like, well, what since then? What have you been doing since then? You have one shift in consciousness already. That's a story from the past. That's something. You know, what about here and now? You ready? Uh, like that. Allow your mind to open. Yeah. But it has to be ongoing. Communication isn't something from 10 years ago. It's now and it's here. And uh, <laughs> you enter into it by opening your mind. It has, even though the body reacts to that moment of mind opening and you have that light insertion, it has nothing to do with the body. The body's just the, the, the vehicle to witness it. Hmm. You know? So. Hmm. That's good stuff. Wow. You're an awesome guy, Dave. You're something else. I mean that. I mean that you are. I, I can just tell. I can just tell by the resonance in your voice and just how you're speaking in such confidence that you have this understanding within. And uh, yeah, man. I'm awake. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you're awake. Yeah. It's also something, no, to that in someone that is awake that is able to convey their awakening where other people can relate a little bit and hopefully you can guide others in that process of your own awakening. You know, there's something special about that. The, the giving back of awakening in a way. And uh, I mean, yeah, there's something special. Quite, it that. wasn't always so. Yeah. It took, it, took a, it took a lot for me to be able to communicate the way I'm talking to you today. Mm. It's like yeah, the, my awakening, my full awakening, like direct union with the divine happened in 1997. Mm. And, I, and that occurred to me at the bottom of a very dark night of my soul when I was basically almost giving up looking for God, heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol to try and stave off the sense of meaningless that, meaninglessness that was crashing in on me every day, you know. And uh, 
when the when the illumination of my mind occurred, um, out of time, not not Dave, you know, when that when that awakening occurred, um, the Dave entity was basically useless to anybody for the next two or three years. Oh yeah. Like it was like you put your finger in a light socket and, and got this massive jolt of electrocution, and it took a long time to recover. Mm. But having recovered now, I can I can tell you how to safely put your finger in the light socket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, hopefully, hopefully you won't have to go through the same process. You know, it's like there's there's two parts to awakening. Two parts. There's the experience, and then there's the purification or the mind training. Mm-hmm. Right, both parts are essential. You have to return your mind to God as it was given to you, pure, empty, free. Right, God only gives in its own likeness of its own self, which is spirit, and it's pure and and there's unsullied. There's no sin. There's no error. There's no nothing. There's nothing of it. It's just this pure force, if you like. Um, and you have to return that as it is, without all the conceptual nonsense of um the physical experience at one time in my mind prior to my illumination it was like this in here yuck 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 judgmental vicious horrible it was a, it was not a nice place to be and i would threaten suicide of myself every other day because i didn't know where these thoughts were coming from i didn't know how to deal with them and the closer i got unbeknownst to me the closer i got to the actual point of my awakening the louder and more raucous it got trying to trying to get me to destroy the avatar, destroy the body. Right? And that's the tenacity of the ego. It would rather have you kill yourself, throw yourself off a cliff on the physical level and have to manifest another form to start all over again rather mm. than awaken. Yeah. You know, because its purpose and the purpose I gave it is to keep me here in the physical dimension, right? to maintain and, and perpetuate the illusion of separation. Mm. That's it. Ego is cunning, suspicious, vicious, and baffling. And you have to take that on board as your own perspective, like recognizing that you're the liar, you're the denial, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that when you do approach that moment of faith, you'll know not to trust yourself. No. Because it's not your own strength through which you heal, it's through the strength of God within you, which you're calling upon through that faithful and faith driven prayer. You know, and you have to pray. That's the medium of miracles. Mm. Holy Spirit. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel that. Present accounted for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like it says in the Course in Miracles: the earth was made as a place for man to undergo his transformation by learning that he gets the results of his own thinking in the nature of the cause and effect relationships you find yourself in on that scale between alpha and omega. So you've got like 50 years or 80 years or 100 years, you know, to to actually wake up, you know, and, and a lot of people will preoccupy themselves so thoroughly they'll never question the meaning of life. Mm. It just, you know, oh, I don't want to know about that. Like, that's that's not for me. You yeah. know, first lifers, first incarnations, it's always like that for them, you know. You get to 20 or 30 incarnations and it's like you ever see a baby when it's first born and they're like screaming. They're looking at their hands and their fingers and their toes. It's like, not this again. And they're like, ah, they don't want to be here. (laughs) You know, like that's literally. (laughs) Yeah, you kind of get exhausted is what you're saying. Yeah, Yeah. right. I mean, do you really want to come back and do this again? Not really. (sighs) No. I right. Prefer not to. Now let that let that not really permeate to where you actually connect with it. Yeah. Right. Where it actually is something that changes the nature of your life. Mm. Did you ever see um what's his name? I was talking to Tina about it. Jim Car Jim Carrey, the comedian. He did Yes Man. Right. So he did he did Yes Man, he did the Truman Show. All oh, yeah. of these are awakening movies. They're beautiful movies about awakening, spiritual awakening, and through the symbols of the silver screen, et cetera, et cetera. Probably unbeknown, I don't want to give him any credit. I'll just treat him as an ignoramus like the rest of us, but probably unbeknownst to him, he just thought he was an actor doing a movie role, Mm -hmm. right? The movie roles, however, are involving him in a separate kind of script from his normal life 
where he's awakening to certain things, right? It's it's punching in the code of his own awakening to the point where all of a sudden he meets Eckhart Tolle, does a workshop or whatever with Eckhart and has a profound experience of the illumination of his mind at whatever level he's at with it, right? And he realises he's one with everything. Um, I actually saw the interview he gave somebody after that uh, experience and uh, whether he's at this place now or not, I don't really know. But he said ever since then he's been trying to get back there, right, which is the denial of what he actually saw. What he actually saw and witnessed to himself is ever-present. There's no back there to get. He's one with all things now. Now, when that integrates, right, like you just said, you know, not really, when when that integrates that not, I don't really want to come back here, when that integrates to the point where all of a sudden you realise what you just said <laughs> and you hear it yourself, beyond the density and the mind fog of consciousness, that's you done. <laughs> Just like, just like Jim Carrey, he probably had no clue why he was uh, doing those movies, why why Gary's doing an interview. I mean, you're <laughs> on dangerous ground. <laughs> <laughs> Am I in the Truman Show? Maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what's interesting about that movie is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. At the end, he decides to go back into the illusion. Right, he doesn't leave the show. He goes back into the Truman Show. All right, everybody, I just want to come in and interject real quick because I was totally wrong. At the end of the Truman Show, he doesn't go back into the illusion, back into the show. He actually leaves it entirely. And the ending is up for interpretation on what he decides to do with his life. So I just wanted to come in and correct myself. And also... I mean, it's kind of too late. I already spoiled the ending. But if you haven't seen The Truman Show, I highly, highly recommend it. It's an awesome, awesome movie. And uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. I apologize. I just think I put my own projection onto the ending. I'm still going to leave it all in there. I don't care. Whatever. I think it's still relevant to the conversation, as you will see. And uh, yeah, that's it, guys. So back to our regularly scheduled programming. And that's how they end it. I think. I'm pretty sure. I haven't seen that in a few years. But yeah, something to that. That's exactly the same thing. Yeah. I woke up in eternity, right? had a deal with Jesus to come back here and represent Course in Miracles in the Universal Curriculum. I'm not really back here, but I'm activating <laughs> the avatar from another whole dimensional or non-dimensional experience of myself, presenting myself through this form. Mm. Any awakened mind is the same thing. It's like the Matrix, Neo. You know, Neo. They they get him out, and then he they, and then they have to send him back in to fight the Smith character or whatever it is. You know, the the thing. But he but he knows within his own mind he's not actually in there now. He's actually in the in the chair in the other in the other realm in the other dimension, using the image of his uh, old idea that he thought he once was to present something else, which is what I'm doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's trippy. It's definitely trippy. It's very trippy. Yeah, I feel that though. Right, good. <laughs> Do you feel that is the sort of archetype to the awakened being is the bodhisattva path? Is you sort of have to give back? I mean, I know some people will say there's a lot of theories out there. Some people say you don't have to. A lot of people leave and you don't have to become the bodhisattva. But the way that I see it is like you kind of if you do feel yourself at one with all, then there has to be an essence of if everybody else isn't free, then I'm not free either. So you have to do the best that you can, that your avatar can to guide others to freedom, right? It's like right. if you see yourself, everyone else as an extension of yourself, then how can you not help? That's how I feel at least. Exactly. It's like the good Samaritan. But... There's, there's a kind of a contradiction or what appears to be a contradiction in spiritual discipline where if I were to catch this in a Louise L. Hay sort of guide for the for the advanced soul sort of way, which is very ground level, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of taking the piss a little here, but uh, you would say, well, 
you have to learn to love yourself before you can love anyone else, right? So the process of awakening is you have to awaken yourself first before you can begin, you know, to, to help others. And Jesus puts it in the in the Bible even as uh, pull the beam from your own eye first and then you will see clearly how to help others, yeah. right? Now, that beam and the eye parable works across the board with many kind of uh, dimensions in, in spiritual pursuit, of even the mirror. You know, I think it was, um, oh, I read a beautiful book called The Prophet by Khalil Gibran where he, where he gives the analogy of the mirror, how everyone's a reflection of your own denial of the truth of yourself and you have to include it all in clean the mirror as you go until you get a perfectly clear reflection, mm -hmm. like shadow work and stuff like that, but... There's this thing that occurs, and I've noticed it extremely prevalently within myself and within the Course in Miracles community, let's say online, where the tendency to want to defend yourself with a spiritual concept that there's no one else out there, right? Now, yeah. from a point of view of uh, your own personal awakening, that's what you have to apply. There is no one separate from me, right? That's verbatim that's the truth there's no one out there ramana mahashi said there are no others right so that's the the truth of the thing however once you have a spiritual awakening you come back in as let's say an activated agency within the dream to help speed up that collapse yeah. it's like if you have if you have a, a physical body and you've got one cancer cell in there it begins to affect all the other cells mm. It's the same thing. So awakening is like a cancer. It's all, you know, like it's a, it's an anti-cancer. It's, it's a healing, but it begins to affect things exponentially and you don't really know how. It's just like I could go and sit on the top of a mountain for the rest of my life never talk to anybody and the process of what my mind, because the universe is mind, everything is just a vibration, the process of my mind simply being present there would do everything it needs to do. Yeah. However, as a symbol representing that to others as the what's possible within each of us, that has the potential to, to put many people on mountaintops, so to speak, you know. And in that regard only, there is others, but it's like it's still one mind waking up. And yeah. It's really hard to explain that. It's like it's, you know, you have to have the experience. Jesus says a universal experience is not only possible but necessary, and it's like it's experience that's the teacher. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very hard to explain in it is, it is mouth it noises. Is. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it's hard to explain in absolute too because sentences always end in an absolute. Right at the end of right. the sentence, at the period, it's like a, it's a, it's a thing that the mind, it's a concept. It's not like that, yeah. Well, you, you can you can sort of explain it easily as an application, right? Mm, yeah. You look at it as the idea of an absolute. Death is an absolute as far as you're concerned. Let's say, right? If if you're a, if you're a newbie to time and space and you're here and you're looking around and everything here dies and you're like, well, what the heck, right? Then death is an absolute. It's unavoidable, right? So basically, uh, you're dead already. You just haven't accepted it, right? And there's this process of coming to a point where it's some undefinable uh, integer, you know, there's going to be this occurrence where death is validated. But at the point where death seems to be validated, you can't prove it to yourself because you're dead, right? In that sense, you would have to literally come back and go looking for your tombstone or something, you know, to try and see if death actually occurred, which means you're alive again, right? Because there is only life. Jesus says in the Course, the opposite of life is not death. It's another form of life, right? And that's momentous. That's enormous. The opposite of life is not death. It's another form of life. That's powerful. It is powerful because it, it sort of does away with all of our possibilities of what we think, you know, oh, when you die, there's just blackness. There's nothing. You just cease to exist. Da, 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 da. Well, if life is eternal and life creates in its own likeness, and you're in another form of life, it must still have those attributes because God is everything. Mm. Right? But you just become unaware of them because the mind is habituated to looking at the particulars of time and space, which is predicated by beginnings and endings. 
Mm-hmm. That's like the small mind. Big mind, have, you know, once you have an experience, you're like, oh, there is no beginnings and endings. There's, there's nothing actually happening here at all other than life appearing to be something. Yeah. And that becomes then an absolute. Mm. Mm-hmm. Your mind, yeah. like inner peace. Inner peace is an absolute. If you set the if you set your goal in life, right? This is really practical. If you set your goal in life as inner peace in every relationship, this one, this one, this one, this one, or eventually they all sort of begin to line up. You may make mistakes, you may get angry, you may do this, that, and the other, but you're healing all of those blocks. You're healing all the removing all the triggers. Eventually, inner peace becomes your state of mind in all things. And your mind attains this kind of singular state. Right? It's not up, it's not down, it's not left, it's not right. Buddha would say it's the middle path. Uh, you, en- you enter into a constancy of that. When your mind attains a constancy of that, it becomes like an absolute state. You're training your mind to train itself. And wherever death plays a part, you refuse to compromise. And it holds you in that, that state of perfect peace. Right, which is a, a singularity, a singular or a constant state. Eternity, let's say, and I, I refer to it as above and below because Jesus does, you know, as above, so below. Eternity is also a constant state. Once they're both vibrating as that constant, st- I mean, one already is, but once you're down here con- vibrating as that singular state, the two things lock and you're gone from here, right? Because there can't be two states in a singularity. There can't be two separate versions of a sing. It's one singularity. God is one thing. That's pretty succinct. There can't be two states in a singularity. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. It's obvious. One, one is real. One is illusory. Yeah. So. Yeah, there can't be life and death. That's right. If God is everything, there is only life. <sighs> That's so obvious. Like right now, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> well, we get lost, you know. The, the mind wants to play tricks on it, on yourself. Right. And well, it begs the question then: if if there is only life, what's this? If God is formless and God is spirit and God is all encompassing, what's this thing that seems to, you know, this world of form? And it has to be an illusion. It has to be a dream. It has to be a dream. There it yeah. is. <laughs> life is but a dream. You want to yeah. wake up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. man. It's a lucid dream. Yeah. For yeah. some people. For some people, exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> One of them ones today. I don't even know what to say, man. Um, shit, I'm just going to sit here and take a few breaths. Do that. Breaths is good. <laughs> yeah see, see where you're at now and you don't even know what to say stay in that place <laughs> it doesn't matter about this interview it doesn't matter if you never post it yeah it'll probably be a good one to post but you know. I don't have to <laughs> any moment throughout the day is that place I don't know yeah. what to say Yeah. Right? seen rightly I don't know what to say is I don't know where the hell I am I don't know what the universe is about. It transposes yeah. to everything. Yeah. And that's honestly the miracle, the nakedness of not knowing. It's like right. laid off your shoulders. Nice. Like, oh. Thank God I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, man. It's yeah, hard work trying to hold it all together and pretend that you know something. It's like, I don't know nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the miracle. That's the miracle right there. And to anyone listening, it may seem like we're we're just we're BSing, we're trying to cope, you know, we're making this stuff up just because we're afraid to die or something. But terrified. Yeah, but this is like this is this is the truth, man. This is like when you really realize that and have that subjective experience and feel it, it's like I don't I, there are no words. It's just, oh, ah, oh. just want to get down and pray, get on my knees and say thank you. Right? right. Eternal That's gratitude. It. It's so beautiful. Yeah, there's that microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Here's the camera. That microphone now is going to remind you of not fulfilling your obligation to what you just said. <laughs> There's some irony in there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. uh, you know, that's funny because I've done over 200 podcast episodes now and I'm like, what more do I have to ask? What more do I have to say? I don't feel as though there's anything more to say yet. Here I am. I'm still somehow end up in front of the camera with people like you. And uh, it just keeps going. Same thing. What's that? Repeating a different version of exactly the same thing. Pretty much. I mean, this is a good conversation. We can say it's the same thing in some way, but this one's really good, Dave. This one's very, um, very, very <laughs> powerful and profound. Uh, yeah, it's the same thing, but yet it's not with every person that I speak to. It's a, it's a weird position that uh, this avatar of Gary seems to be in. Right. I'm just going with the flow. This is what like it yields. Jim Carrey. That's it. Yeah, I'm feeling like Jim Carrey. Feeling like somewhere between Neo and Jim Carrey in the Truman Show. Right. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm just having fun. I find this extremely enjoyable. Like, I feel as though, like, a, there is this, like, subtle obligation. I don't even know if that's the right word, but I'll say it. There's this obligation in in my will to come on here and speak to people like you and put it out to the world, almost as, like, a testament, you know, to provide proof, to hopefully, to somebody that this is real and show people guides like you so that hopefully you can guide people to see this and i don't know i feel like uh, there's no better use of my time because this is truly a blessing man and I'm, i don't i'm not just saying that because we're talking here and on camera like i said i don't care i don't need to upload this to be able to speak to you from across the world you know you're you're in tomorrow land <laughs> it's, yeah. you're in the future you're across the world right now and we're able to speak like this as if we're in the same room and have this kind of conversation to me it's like how can i not do this this is like a blessing right. i always think like if i could get ramana maharshi on a zoom call i wish i could so um right. i'm trying to find the other ramana maharshis or awakened beings out there to get them on a zoom call so yeah it's like i i, I can't find any better use for my time man it's uh truly a blessing to come on here with you there dude. is a better use for your time actually and what's that Look down the microphone. <laughs> I can't do that. It's not that time. <laughs> I mean, well, I definitely can. You know, I would feel bored. Listen, if it's not that time now, when is it ever going to be? When I run out of people to talk to. <laughs> That's what I say. That's my motto. When I can't find anybody else to speak to to provide this testament, um, that's when I'll stop. I don't know you why. Know, There's the greatest, something in me. The greatest use of your time is your own awakening. Oh, hang on. I'm just going to... Yep, you think. Someone ringing. The greatest use of your time is to learn to use time to your advantage for your actual awakening, for your for your whole... But uh, that changes everything. That affects more people than you sitting there talking to a microphone. Like if you want to look at it biblically, there's 144,000 lined up behind you waiting for you to take your place. You know, you ever read that book, The Reluctant Messiah, or what's it, The Illusions by Richard Bach, The Reluctant Mes Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah? No. Literally, your messiahship, if you like, is being offered to you all the time, as it is with everybody. But instead of that, you've got a better use for time on your own terms, according to you, which is the microphone and the interviews and whatever, which is cool. But it's always going to bring you back around to the same point, or it should if you're paying attention. It's like, Gary, do you want this? Gary, do you want this? Gary, do you want this? Everyone's going to be offering you the same opportunity to enter into a whole new understanding of yourself. Mm. Yeah. I remember watching a, a Dan Dean interview with my teacher, Ted, and Ted went on and presented exactly the same, uh, the same thing, you know. Dan was there and... Uh, playing the part of the interviewer and couldn't break from that or wouldn't break from that. But yet this is in the days before mobile phones and whatever, and they had the big cameras on the stands and there was a studio and Ted had, to, they, they were in the same room and everything. But the cameraman, this is a funny story, right? The cameraman had a full experience, a full awakening experience right there while he was looking through the viewfinder and, and intellectualizing what was being presented. Mm -hmm. And he left the show. He his <laughs> All right, so, see you guys. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Two on the bench, one will be chosen. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I feel like that. 
Yeah, man. Well, I actually do feel like this is part of my part of my sadhana and um, hopefully aiding in other people's sadhanas. That's the real reason why I do it. I try to I'm hopefully to help out that. a little bit. What's that? I'm grateful to you for that. I'm grateful to you. It's only possible because of people like you, man. Seriously. And um, yeah, we'll see how it ends up. Just going with the flow and having a having a grand old time. But uh, I, I, I will heed your words. I know what you mean. What'd you say? I already know how it ends up. Yeah, yeah. I think I already know how it ends up too. <laughs> but until then, the microphone is in front of my face. <laughs> They're cold. I'm not gonna look at it the same now. Like you said, I'm always gonna remember that. It's always gonna be right here. And be like, oh, oh exactly. There you oh, go, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> is that doorway? <laughs> it's the doorway. The microphone is the doorway. The Some kind of joke, man. Some kind of joke. I think you said that in a recent video. It's uh, right. eventually you just come to realize that it's it's all a joke. Some kind of elaborate joke. joke. You kind of get tired of laughing at the punchline, really. Like when I first had my awakening, I could not stop laughing. Like literally for the first six months, all day, every day, spontaneously, and my sides would hurt, and I wished I could stop laughing, and it was this automatic response to everything. And eventually that got grounded, but it is. It's just a joke. That's why, why Buddha was often termed the laughing Buddha. You have an awakening, you know, like the sadhus of India, they're often, the Shivites and that, they're often termed as the wandering madmen mm. because they're, they're always laughing. They're always just like they don't take – you can't take anything seriously. Yeah. No, That's the essence, including yeah. including the, the final process, including all of this. It's like, well, what is this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's nothing appear as it's nothing trying to appear as something seemingly credible to help others. Well, that's not true. <laughs> That's the joke. Yeah. It's the yeah. door. It's literally in the Truman Show. It's that door on the other side of the lake. All you gotta do is get in the boat and sail across, and there it is. Mm. Okay. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what time is it? Oh, okay, we're already about fifty minutes in. I don't have much else to say, man. Um we're done. speechless again. I mean I'm surprised we didn't already touch upon this. Would you say this whole thing, this whole revelation comes to some kind of ultimate seeing of that God is love. You know, I'm surprised we didn't even say the L word at all in this. Well, the, the word love is the best we've got to try and describe it. I mean, you know, like, yeah, you know, yeah. When you add the word unconditional to the front of it, it becomes sort of tangible in a certain sense and intangible in another sense. And it's like, God is unconditional love. Oh, that, well, that's tangible. But then when you think about what unconditional love is based on your own references, it becomes this kind of like, well, how is that possible? Because that person is this and this person is that. I can't, you know, like it's just, you know. So your definitions of what love, the word love, is entirely limited. Mm. You know? Like God, God is, like simply God is, you know, like that's it. You can add the word love there so you have some kind of reference to begin to make your way as far as concepts and ideas about God go in the world, but eventually all of that falls away. Like the universe just exists. God just is. It's like there's no need to define it. There's no need to give it a meaning. Mm -hmm. It's that process of overall accepting things as they are without the need to clarify it that allows you to pass through it in peace to be in the world and not of it. Mm -hmm. Basically the lack of judgment say that again it's the laying aside of judgment oh yeah mm -hmm. once, you accept, forgiveness. once you accept the nature of things it's like well there's nothing more to accept now what am i going to do continue to judge it so that i can accept it again that's pointless mm. yeah. mm -hmm. god is god, god is. is that's god it is. that's it if you've never if you go on YouTube, right, if you've never watched the story of A Course in Miracles with Glynis John, who's doing the voice for Helen Shookman, who's passed, and Bill Thetford, he's he's in the in the film. It's a documentary. Mm -hmm. Watch it. It is incredible. The first, it's two hours long. The first hour is the story, and the second hour is more testimonies of people that come along afterwards. 
But that first hour, the bit where Helen talks about what she's going through in the beginning before she starts hearing Jesus' voice, you know, mind-blowing. And you'll probably relate to it. I'm glad you brought that up because I've never heard of it. So it's the story of how it was. The story uh, of A Course in Miracles. Just type in the story of A Course in Miracles and you'll find it there. Wow. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. It's cool. <laughs> well, it hey, Dave. Uh, I think we should wrap it up, to be honest with you. We could go cool. on and on and on and saying s- stuff that really doesn't really mean that much. Kind of, It does, but it also doesn't. But I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> do you have? <laughs> do you have anything else? Uh, You've you already say? said it all. <laughs> I, t- I might have. Yeah. Dream's already <laughs> over. Yeah. <laughs> You're already awake. Yeah. Yeah. You just want to leave it at that. You want to wrap it up at that? Yeah. No, that's fine by me. Cool. Have fun. All right. Well, hey, I really appreciate you coming on here. This is an honor. Well, to do this you. i thank you and i wish you all the best man seriously and um yeah thank you to everybody that listened this long if you got through it i appreciate you and that's it let's keep on keeping on everybody peace and love